first we'll talk about steam power plants. Here you can see three different types of uh, power plants working with uh, hot steam to generate electricity. On the one hand, in the upper left hand corner, you see a picture of a hot coal power plant. Uh, then on the right hand side, uh, brown coal or lignite based power plant. Uh, so they use coal, uh, burnt coal and uh, generate electricity. And finally, at the bottom, you see a picture of the nuclear power plant Catenor in France. Uh, this uh, power plant is using uranium to generate electricity. The principle is the same. Uh, what you get is you get heat, you heat up water, boil the water and use the hot steam to drive turbines. Here you can see the principle of a steam power plant. So you have uh, the water circle, so you have the water running through the boiler. Uh, the water is heated up, is boiled, uh, that we get hot steam. The hot steam runs through a turbine, spins the turbine. The turbine drives the generator to generate electricity. And then the hot steam is cooled down in a condenser uh, that we get cold water and return it to our circle. So, uh, first you see uh, two pictures of uh, the inner part of a boiler. Uh, so you see here uh, the water running through uh, tubes uh, in the boiler. Uh, coal is burned uh, to boil the water and then we get hot steam. Here on the right hand side you see the ashes, uh, the ash of, of the coal coming from, from the bottom of the boiler. Uh, then we need to transport the hot steam to the turbines. You see all these uh, tubes here on the uh, two pictures uh, to drive the turbines. Uh, we have the generator, so the hot steam runs through the generator and drives the generator that we get a rotation um, and the rotation in the magnetic field. Uh, induces electricity that we can uh, feed this electricity to the grid. Uh, and finally, what we need is we need to be a river to cool down our hot steam. So after running through the turbine, we still have hot steam, but we need cool water that this water can uh, pump back to the boiler. So we have a condenser and we take cold water from a river and cool down uh, the hot steam by exchanging the heat energy and then we can pump back our water to our boiler. To understand how our steam power plant is working and how water and steam is used, um, we have to take first a look at a PV diagram you know from thermodynamics. So here in this figure you see uh, the specific volume on the y on the x-axis and the pressure on the y-axis and uh, the different states of uh, water. You see here uh, these black curves uh, represent the uh, isothermals. Uh, so the constant temperature, what is the pressure, what's the specific volume of hot steam. So you see here uh, the different temperatures. The higher the temperature, uh, the closer uh, the hot steam uh, behaves like an ideal gas. But if you get closer to this uh, green curve, this saturation curve, um, then what we see is we, we see a change of the phase. So here we are the gaseous phase, so we have the steam. Uh, on the left hand side, here in this very small part, there's uh, liquid uh, water. Uh, so the liquid phase uh, under different pressure conditions uh, and here in this part beneath the saturation curve we are uh, with wet steam, so a mixture of liquid water and uh, gaseous water. Um, these uh, dashed lines represent uh, the share of water and, and hot steam, so see the larger these volumes are the more steam content is uh, in this wet steam, so 0.3 means that we have 30% gaseous and uh, 0.7 or 70% uh, liquid water. 
Uh, you see here also marked in, in red the critical point. So that's uh, one important uh, point uh, for, uh, for water uh, at 221.3 bars, uh, a temperature of 347.15 degrees Celsius and a specific volume of 0.0031 cubic meters per kilogram. At this point, uh, the liquid phase vanishes, so we don't get any liquid phase anymore um, of the water. And now we use this knowledge uh, to describe a power plant that we use liquid water, we heat up the water, uh, get hot steam, and this gaseous water, this steam, can drive a turbine, we get a rotation, and uh, we can generate electricity. And then what we need to do is we need to cool down this hot steam, so we go back uh, to the left-hand side, get liquid water, reduce the energy content of the water, and can restart our circle. This figure shows a simplified cycling process of a steam power plant. So we have uh, four steps uh, in the, our circle. Uh, we are starting at the bottom with uh, liquid water, um, pump it or compress it with a pump, uh, so we add some, uh, some energy uh, to the compressor that we increase the pressure of our liquid water. Then our liquid water runs through the boiler. Uh, we heat up the water uh, by using heat from burning coal or by the fission of uranium in a nuclear power plant. Then what we get is hot steam at, uh, let's say, 500 degrees Celsius, even more. Uh, get to uh, point number three, uh, that's our turbine, so at a very high temperature, high pressure, uh, this hot steam drives the turbine, generates electricity, uh, we lose energy, and then we need to get rid of the heat which is still uh, within our hot steam, so we run through a condenser uh, by a heat exchange using a river, for example, uh, we get rid of the of the heat and then finally we can close our thermodynamical circle uh, by getting liquid water back and then we can rerun our process. In order to increase the efficiency of a steam power plant so that we get more energy from our Rankine process, uh, which you can see here are two different types of uh, this uh, four-step Rankine process. Uh, on the left hand side, what you can see uh, is in, in, in green this Rankine process. So, uh, running uh, through the, uh, the compressor, running through the boiler, increase the heat content. Then, in this case here, uh, we have just hot steam, and then the steam in the boiler is uh, still uh, increasing its heat content by increasing the temperature rather fast. Then we run through the turbines, so falling down roots, lose the energy uh, in, this, uh, in the steam, and then we need to get back in the condenser to close our circle. So that's uh, the energy content, uh, it's, it's again marked in green. And what we now do is uh, we want to get more energy. So what we need to do is, on the one hand, we need to reach higher temperatures, uh, but still we have to keep within this yellow marked uh, Part so that we have this uh, this uh, saturation curve uh, of the water. So we are starting uh, in a typical red kind circle of a coal power plant here at the bottom. So we compress the water, uh, then we add the heat in the boiler, reach rather higher temperatures at high pressures. You see here we have pressure of uh, let's say 150 bars, and that's the reason why we compress the water. See here, following this black curve, we reach 150 bars. So, if the water is compressed, we can increase the temperature on a higher level uh, without changing uh, the liquid state. So, we are in the boiler, high pressure, then we have the change of the state from liquid to the gaseous one, we get this hot steam, and then we can continue to increase the temperature. So, here we reach a uh, temperature of 450 and even 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, so we have a lot more energy stored in our hot steam. Then we run through our 
uh, turbine, we uh, again spin the turbine, we lose uh, uh, we lose energy in the steam, so we get back to our wet steam region here at the bottom at, you can see this here, at a rather low uh, pressure. So following these curves here, you see we are uh, at 0 0.05 bar. So rather small pressure, so uh, that's a uh, second idea, a second concept to increase uh, the area of our, uh, of our process, of our cycle, that we fall downwards to a low pressure. And then we run through the condenser back to our initial uh, state that we have liquid water, uh, cool water at a low pressure, and then we can restart our process that we again compress the water at the heat of the boiler, etc. And this here means uh, with high pressure um, uh, of, the, of the steam that we have higher temperatures and on the other hand that we have a low pressure after the turbine that we can increase the size of our uh, circle and then we can get more energy from the same amount of, of coal we are burning so we can reach a higher efficiency level of our steam power plant. Two steam turbines are shown on this uh, figures. So you see on the left hand side uh, the part of the turbine, on the right hand side you see here the, the inlet and the outlet of our hot steam and here in the back you see uh, the generator uh, to, to generate electricity. So what's happening here, the, the hot steam goes through the inlet and drives or spins this part of uh, the turbine um, and then uh, runs back to uh, the outlet and what we get is we get this rotation of this uh, uh, of this turbine uh, this drives uh, by the connection of this shaft uh, this drive our generator the generator is uh, covered in a magnetic field so that we get electricity uh, so AC power which can be fed in to the grid this is a picture of a former coal-fired power plant at the Rhine River uh, close to the city uh, Duisburg in the western part of the Ruhr Valley. So uh, what you see is here uh, the part of the power plant. Uh, so we have four power plant units with a total output of 2.2 gigawatts. Uh, and this, uh, this power plant, which has been uh, installed in uh, 1971 with the two extensions in uh, 82 and uh, 85. Uh, so you see here uh, on the one hand this part here that's uh, for the ships uh, uh, with the coal uh, and then we have the part of the, uh, of the power plant with the boilers. Uh, here at the back part you see this cooling tower. Uh, with, a, with a cloud so that we have the condenser. Uh, of course we need to get rid of the heat in the condenser and that's uh, by, uh, done in this, in this cooling tower with this typical four steam power plants. Of course the Rhine River is used uh, to cool down uh, this Rankine process. Uh, this power plant has stopped its operation uh, at the 31st of March uh, 2017 uh, and what you see is here about uh, 11,000 gigawatt hours have been produced in the best time um, and now this uh, power plant has stopped its operation due to uh, a low cost efficiency. You can see a head frame of coal mine uh, again in the northwestern part of the Ruhr Valley. So again this is a former uh, coal mine which isn't used. Uh, you see uh, the beginning of the demolishment uh, of this uh, coal mine. Uh, of course, this head frame uh, was used to uh, grab uh, the coal, to so transport the coal uh, from the ground and on the other end uh, to um, transport the people downwards uh, to the mine. Uh, this coal mine has been demolished uh, as all coal mines in, in Germany as there are no hard coal mines anymore um, in Germany. Here you can see a picture of a quarry uh, of uh, lignite or brown coal uh, in 
the western part of Germany. So what you see here is this very large region where the lignite is produced uh, in this large hole. So there's no mine, but it's uh, done in this in this quarry. And uh, what you can do, or what you need to do, is you need to burn this lignite right at the place. There's no, it's not uh, efficient from an economic point of view to transport the lignite uh, over far distances. So what you, what we have is in this case that there are uh, lignite power plants close to this quarry um, to burn this lignite and generate electricity. One major disadvantage of these uh, lignite quarries is that we have to demolish villages which lie close to this uh, quarry. Uh, what you can see here are three pictures of the former village Boschmich in Western Germany. So you see here uh, in the back of this figure um, you see this uh, excavator uh, grabbing the lignite. You see here uh, on this picture that they've started to demolish the houses. Uh, the people have uh, already been moved away uh, and got new homes by the energy utility and now they demolish the houses, demolish the village that uh, they can uh, grab the lignite in this uh, increasing query. Here you see a picture of the lignite power plant Naurat um, in the western part of Germany, close uh, to the city Grevenbroich. So what you see, one of the largest uh, coal power plants uh, in Germany. Uh, this power plant has a total capacity of about 4.4 gigawatts. It uses lignite to generate electricity. The coal production globally has been risen from 1981 up to now. So what you can see here with data from the Statistical Review of World Energy of BP is the development of the coal production. So you see here on the y-axis this is the coal production in gigatons, so billion tons. And what you see is in particular that significant increase of coal production, so getting coal, mining coal in Asia, that's uh, in, in yellow, and in red, that's China. So they have increased their production rate very, very fast. On the other hand, in Europe, marked in, in green, the, the production rate has decreased. You see here uh, we've had, let's say, one gigaton uh, production rate, and today uh, in 2017, 2018, we are just at uh, 0.7 gigatons as well in the United States, Canada, Mexico, so North America marked in, in blue. Um, and in total, uh, annually, uh, about, yeah, let's say, 8 gigatons are, are grabbed. Um, coal is a rather cheap energy source. It can grab uh, or mine rather easily. Uh, and uh, then is used in coal power plants all over the world. The price development per ton of hard coal can be seen on this figure. So you see um, the prices in different parts of the world marked in the different colors. So in Europe, United States in blue, in China in orange and Japan in yellow. So the slope of the curse is rather, uh, rather similar. You see here the costs in US dollars uh, per ton. So you see uh, on a Coal has been on a constant uh, cost of, let's say, $40 per ton in the 80s and 1990s. And then we have this increase due to the increasing demand of, in particular, in China as well as in, in Asia. Uh, and at the moment, we have a cost of about $100 US dollars per ton, which have to be paid to, to get hot coal. The share of uh, the key regions in the global coal demand can be seen in this uh, diagram. Again, the data uh, have been taken from the Statistical Review of World Energy of uh, BP. So what you can see is, uh, on the one hand, that China has increased the share, so the use of the, of the coal in their coal power plants. So at the moment, China uh, has a share of about 50%. On the other hand, you see the drop of the share, so the drop of usage of, of coal in Europe, marked in, in, in green, and in North America, beginning, beginning of the year, about, uh, let's say, 2000, that the share has dropped. Um, 
on the other hand, uh, China and Asia as well, so the other Asian countries uh, like in particular India, for example, uh, are increasing their share. They use more and more coal in their coal power plants to generate electricity. Where does the hard coal and the lignite come from? What you see here in this, um, in this figure is, uh, on the one hand, on the axis you see the age of Earth in million years, so we have 100, 200, 300, 400, and we get 500 million years back in time. You see the different geologic periods and geologic eras, and mainly there are two periods um, of uh, the coal formation. Uh, we have the hard coal formation, you see here this uh, slope of this uh, dark blue curve. So we have this carboniferous uh, period, uh, with a line between about 300 and 360 million years past uh, or going back in, in, in time. And this during this period, uh, the hard coal has been formed from, from, from plants. And then we have a constant production rate or formation rate. And then the lignite, it's a rather a new type of coal, which has just an age of uh, 23 to 66 million years in the Paleogene period. Uh, so these are two, the two main periods uh, of coal formation uh, of, of lignite and this carboniferous uh, period of the formation of hard coal. There are mainly two different phases in the coalification so that uh, coal is formed uh, what you can see uh, on this picture are the different steps of the codification. First, we have the biochemical phase, so that we have the diagenesis of plant residues to uh, peat. So we have a decomposition uh, of the biomass, so that the first uh, step, you can see here the peat uh, on the left-hand side. And then second, we have the geochemical phase, so that's abiotic without any oxygen. And we have increasing tr uh, temperature, increasing pressure, uh, and what's happening is that we have the accumulation of carbon uh, through oxygen exclusion. So reducing, uh, so we reduce the water, the uh, carbon dioxide, and the methane that we get a higher share of carbon uh, per volume. And overall, uh, what we get is here at the bottom. You see. Um, hard coal or different types of hard coal, that we have a volume reduction from the uh, former plant uh, to the hard coal uh, up to 10% of the uh, initial volume of the biomass. This map shows uh, the European coal belt. So you see the western or northwestern part of Europe. Uh, you see here the cities uh, of the Ruhr Valley, Duisburg, Essen and Dortmund uh, with the main region of the German hard coal production. Um, and then these coal belts marked in uh, light gray uh, run uh, over to, to Antwerp. You see here uh, at the, in the southern part of Belgium and in the northern part of France, so close to the uh, cities Lille and Charleroi in, in Belgium. Uh, one coal belt and there's a small one in, in Dover on the left hand side of this map. Of course there are more coal belts in the United Kingdom and in this region uh, coal production has been uh, done in the past uh, in, in Germany in particular. Uh, there are no hard coal mines anymore. You see here the small city Ibenbüren. Uh, it's a small city close to the city Münster in the northwestern part of Germany. This was uh, the city with, with the last hard coal mine in Germany. So the chronicle of mining in the Ruhr Valley in, in Germany is shown on, on this uh, slide. So the beginning of coal finds or uh, the first uh, written mention of coal finds was in the 13th century and then in the 16th century uh, there was a beginning of tunnel construction to grab the hard coal and then uh, the development was rather fast so the river Ruhr becomes uh, navigable uh, up to the Rhine in the year about uh, 1780 and then we have had the mining zone the first mining zone in the 
mid of the 19th century, which is uh, the connection between the cities Duisburg, Essen, Bochum, Dortmund, so the big uh, mining uh, cities uh, in the Ruhr Valley. Uh, and then step by step, uh, this uh, mining zone moved uh, to the north. So see, uh, even uh, 25 years later, the mining zone has moved to uh, the cities Oberhausen, Bottrop, Herne and Kastrup, so northern uh, to these uh, cities here on the left hand side. Uh, in the year 1873, we have, about, uh, have had about 250 coal mines with a coal production of uh, 16 million tons um, per year. Then we've had uh, the two world wars and uh, after the second world war, there was a, again the big, large use of uh, hard coal mines, coal production in Germany. And at the end of the 50s, uh, beginning of the 60s, we've had the beginning of the coal crisis. So the uh, costs of hard coal coming from Germany was, uh, they would have been larger than the costs uh, to, to buy just coal on the global market. So it was the beginning of the closure of coal mines and the reduction of uh, production. And um, in 2002, we've had just, just seven coal mines operating in Germany. And in the end of 2018, we've had the closure of the last two coal mines in Germany. And so we don't have any hard coal production in, in Germany anymore. We just uh, have uh, lignite uh, production uh, in the eastern and the western part of Germany. If you compare the number of coal fire power plants uh, in different countries, what you can see here with the use of data of the website endcoal.org from January 2020. Uh, you can see on the one hand uh, the industrial countries, United Kingdom, Germany, United States, with the number of operating coal power plants. So the number of coal power plants are rather small. You see here uh, United States 280, Germany we have uh, just 74 coal power plants, and even the United Kingdom, which is the origin of the Industrial Revolution, they have just seven operating coal power plants. On the other hand, the emerging countries, India and China, they, they mainly rely on coal for the electricity generation. You see India nearly 300 operating coal power plants, so even more than the United States. And China has more than 1,000 operating coal power plants, and, and they still have uh, 200 power plants under construction. So in Germany, there's just one, or there are just two um, power plants under construction. So one under construction, one under pre construction. There are no new plant coal power plants in the United Kingdom or in the United States. So uh, coal is not an interest in any more for United States or United Kingdom. But in India and in China, they will increase the use of coal power plants um, in the near and mid-term future um, and will increase, of course, the emission of greenhouse gas emissions by the use of, of hard coal and lignite uh, in their coal power plants. The question is now, why is coal uh, that popular for electricity generation? And what we can see here on the slide is what are the electricity production costs uh, for, on the one hand, fossil uh, energy uh, systems and on the other hand, for renewable ones. And so what you see here in the in euro cent per kilowatt hour, so what are what is the costs uh, for uh, getting electricity from a nuclear power plant, lignite, hard coal, um, gaseous uh, or CCPP is a, gas and uh, steam power plant and on the right hand side you see the renewable systems wind onshore and offshore and uh, photovoltaic systems and what you can see is here even in particular the, the brown coal the lignite is a rather cheap source so one kilowatt hour of electric energy from a, a lignite a power plant just costs four to eight cents per kilowatt hour uh, hard coal is slightly more expensive, nuclear is on the same level. Uh, of course, keep in mind, these are the costs for older uh, power plants. If you uh, set up a new power plant, the costs are even uh, higher, but the old systems can produce uh, electricity rather cheap. Um, and that's the reason why still coal and uh, even nuclear power plants are in use. 
uh, as they provide a very cheap and easy to handle uh, energy source uh, to fulfill the energy demand uh, all over the world. This is a picture of the nuclear power plant Catanon in the eastern part of France. Um, it's the third largest nuclear power plant in France and the ninth largest nuclear power plant uh, in the world. Um, you see these four cooling towers uh, belonging to the four uh, pressurized water reactors of this uh, power plant, which uh, uh, and these reactors have an electric output of 1.3 gigawatts each. On this picture you can see here in the back, this is the steam cloud of the power plant Catenon, uh, seen from the uh, city Trier. So the distance to uh, Catenon is about 50 kilometers. So even under uh, this, these weather conditions you can, you can see the that this nuclear power plant of Cotton was rather close to the city Trier and to the location of our university. The process of fission of uranium-235 is shown on this figure. So what's happening? We have the uranium-235 uh, with one neutron which is absorbed by the uranium atom, so we get this uh, instable isotope uranium-236 and then this uh, atom, this isotope, uh, is split in two smaller parts, in this example uh, to barium and krypton, and what uh, we also get is a lot of uh, energy, in this case 213 mega electron volts, and in this reaction we get three new neutrons which can fly around. Uh, these neutrons can again be absorbed by uranium-235 atoms and then we again have this fission process of one uranium atom. And you see now what we get is by these new um, neutrons which are released in this fission process that we get a cascade of uh, this uh, fission of these uranium atoms. And uh, what we always get are these uh, so this amount of energy we can, which can be used to uh, heat up the water in a nuclear power plant. This diagram shows the global energy production by nuclear power. You can see um, in the data taken from the Statistical Review of World Energy of BP um, beginning in the 1965 up to now, uh, this increase in particular in the 1970s and 1980s uh, in Europe marked in green and North America marked in, in dark blue, that these regions have increased their nuclear energy generation very, very fast and keep this high level. Up to now, what you see, there's a slight increase in, in, the, in Asia uh, and the Pacific, so Australia. And you see, even China has increased its global energy production, but not in the same manner that uh, they use coal uh, power plants um, in their country. Uh, at the moment, what we have is a total uh, global nuclear energy generation of uh, let's say uh, 2.6 petawatt hours. So it's a significant share of the electricity generation, but it's a small share compared to the coal power plants uh, globally. The data of the International Energy Agency about the regional distribution of nuclear power generation shows uh, on the one hand uh, in the year 1973 that uh, more than 90% of the nuclear power generation was located in the OECD countries. Um, up to now uh, the power generation is more than 12 times larger than we've had this situation in 1973. Still, the OECD contributes with uh, three quarters uh, of the total global nuclear power generation. But also new countries or regions uh, occur. China has a share of 10%, of but still the share of China is rather small compared to other uh, generation, power generation systems like in particular coal. Um, the nuclear power is still uh, used mainly in the OCD countries like United States, uh, Europe or Japan. The share of nuclear energy of electricity 
production is shown in this diagram. What you can see is what is the share of the nuclear energy uh, in the nationwide uh, electricity production. Uh, you can see the development of different uh, countries. Let's start with France, this dark blue curve. So up to now, France, uh, nearly 80% of the electricity production comes from nuclear power plants. In other countries, you see uh, the share lies between 20 and 30%. Uh, like United Kingdom in yellow, Germany in, in, in green, the United States are a constant on a level of 20%. You see this drop in Japan, this orange curve, uh, due to this um, meltdown in Fukushima at the end of uh, in the year 2011. So they stopped using nuclear power plants. Um, they ramp it up again nowadays. But you see that this decline, uh, in particular in Germany, Germany stops, we will stop using nuclear power until the year 2022. Other countries are on a constant level, even China is on a constant level with a small share of uh, just 2 or 3 percent. So you see uh, nuclear power has been an interesting technology in the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, interesting alternative to coal, for example, but today nuclear power isn't competitive anymore, so we are keeping on a high level um, with a small decrease within the next years and decades. One issue regarding uh, the use of nuclear power are, of course, the, the costs of disasters. Um, here are different or three different um, disasters you see here in, in 1979 Harris Field, then we have Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima and the costs, you see the costs for Chernobyl at the moment about 140 billion euros. The cost of Fukushima up to now is about let's say 235-240 billion euros and increasing. Um, what we also have is, um, for example, the, the German uh, location Asse, where the nuclear waste has been stored. Um, now they identify that this, um, this place isn't safe anymore, so uh, the nuclear waste has to be grabbed up and placed at, or located in another place. So the costs for this um, um, replacement are about 6 billion euros which have to be paid. And what you see here on this figure of Ingmar Runge um, is uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant uh, and uh, what you can see is here this new um, confinement. So the construction of the confinement to protect uh, the reactor of uh, this former nuclear power plant in Chernobyl with as a reason for these very high costs um, to uh, handle uh, this uh, this meltdown. And so, of course, you have to keep this in mind that uh, nuclear power plants, uh, typically they are safe, of course, but in case of any incident, uh, we have rather high costs uh, we have to handle. And this makes nuclear power very, very expensive if you consider all costs and all risks.